Good evening to everyone, whether you're listening by video or someone over in the fellowship hall, possibly someone out in the vehicle on the radio. Uh, we welcome everyone to the evening service here at Pine Grove Missionary Baptist Church of Linside, West Virginia. We just appreciate uh, you thinking about tuning in. Trust that God will bless you and challenge you with word and truth this evening, meet your needs. And just ask that you'll uh, open up your heart and let God have his way with you. You won't go wrong. As we begin the service, let's go to him in prayer. Let's ask his blessing. Father, as we come to you in prayer once again, we thank you for this time, Father, to open up your word, Father, and to hear your word, to hear the truth. And Father, we just thank you so much that you love us, you care for us, and Father, you, you're the Bible's your love letter to us father that teaches us righteous and brings us to salvation and father without it we wouldn't be able to to make it and father i just pray as we uh, look into your word that the holy spirit will guide and direct us unto truth that you'll speak through me that people will hear you and not me and father that lives will be changed and challenged and father just ask that you search us out and anything that's in our life father that's displeasing to you i pray that you bring it to our attention help us to be humble enough to to admit it and to ask forgiveness and to draw closer to you i just ask that you be with our leaders of our country and father for all the things going on around us and people have authority over so i just pray that you would uh, speak to those hearts father that they would look to you father for guidance and direction and decision making that affects us all and Father, just have your way with us now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. The title of the message this evening is Hope in the Future. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty in our country and the world these days, amen. Our economy's kind of crumbling. Our legal and political systems are corrupted. Our health care system is declining and failing our society's in a moral decline, and we're going spiritually bankrupt. Amen. A lot of things seems to be going downhill and downhill uh, in our society today, but God is still in control, and we have to remember that and trust that God's going to see us through these times. And uh, if you would, turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, I know this has been visited in the past a little bit, but we're going to look at some things in it again. Second Timothy chapter 3, we're going to look at all 17 verses, we'll read these and then we'll expound upon them a little bit. So follow along if you would, Second Timothy chapter 3, again with verse 1, this Know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, and more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Verse 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust, ever learning and ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And now as Janice and Jambres, which stood, withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of them... All the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto good works. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. As we read through these verses, we can understand that in these last days, perilous times will come. Perilous means dangerous, risky, or hazardous. And it's because of apostasy falling away from God and his standards. You know, we can see that around us now, can't we? And it's probably going to get worse. It's becoming more dangerous. It's becoming more risky. Uh, I think as time goes on, it will probably become uh, a higher risk to serve the Lord in this country. Our freedoms might be approached. You know, things as uh, we've seen that through the pandemic, some churches and places was uh, being uh, uh, threatened to, uh, as far as having services and being fined and all kinds of things. You know, so we're seeing things change from what they've always been or what they used to be. And, you know, we don't know how bad it'll get. We don't know how bad it will be before the Lord Jesus comes for us. We don't know. But with these conditions, we'll be faced with more and more troubles and tribulations. You can just guarantee it. We already have storms in our life, don't we? If you're not in a storm, you've just come out of one or you're headed in one. Everybody has problems. There's people that's sick. There's people that's lost loved ones. There's people that's got family problems. There's people that have health issues. There's people that has a uh, problem with finances. There's all kinds of storms and problems and tribulations, isn't it? And when you're out in the workplace and when you're for young people, it's out in, in schools and colleges, being, being a Christian isn't the most popular thing on campus in most places. There's a lot of things that's going on and it's hard to find good Christian influence, isn't it? We as Americans expect help from our political leaders and our representatives, don't we? You know, everybody puts every, every emphasis on elections. And elections is important. We should pray. We should seek out to find out what the uh, people that's running for office, what they stand for, what they believe in. We should pray about it and try to choose the ones that we feel like is what God would want. And, but you know, the sad part of it is for years, our political system has become more and more corrupt. They just fuss and complain and try to, to ruin each other's reputation. They won't work together for the benefit of the people. It just seems like it's a hopeless case, isn't it? We look to them to make things better. And they should try to make things better but we can't rely upon that, can we? We can't rely upon them. We hope for things to make a turnaround, to improve and to get better, but without the power and the blessings from God, there's not a chance that they're gonna get better, is it? You know, America has turned her back on things of God. We've took prayer out of school. We've took the 10 Commandments and the Word of God out of all public places and We've, we are allowing so many things that's totally against God to be highlighted in our country. And when we're doing that, there's no way in the world that God's going to continue to bless that. Amen. He doesn't bless sin. He blesses faithfulness. In verse 5 of our scripture reading, it says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. This gives an indication that there's going to be plenty of religion, but no God in it. There's a lot of people, so many people you talk to, oh, I believe in God. I believe in God. Well, the devil believes in God, doesn't he? But he doesn't worship God. He hasn't accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. There's a lot of people that go to church, but they don't, they have a form of godliness. In other words, they claim it. They go to church, 
but they're denying the power of God. They're denying the power of the word of God, and there's no God in it. There's a lot of people that claims to be Christians, and when the Lord Jesus comes for his church, the rapture of the church, there's going to be a lot of people left behind that thought they was ready to go. Why? Because he left Jesus Christ out. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh unto the Father but by me. Without Christ, you're not going to heaven. You can be a church member. You can be a deacon. You can be a pastor. You can be a lot of things in a church, but without Christ in the heart, you're lost. You're lost and you're undone. There's a lot of false doctrines, a lot of false teachings throughout the world and throughout America that people are being misled. They don't hear the, the gospel preached to them. So in these days, we can see that only getting worse and worse. Let's look at verse 8. It says here in verse 8, And now as Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds repro reprobate concerning the faith. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. A reprobate is someone who has rejected God and they're beyond hope of salvation. God gives everybody a chance, an opportunity to be saved. It's not God's will that any perish, but all come under repentance. But when he deals with you and deals with you and you're, you turn him away, you turn him away for salvation, God didn't say he's going to hound you and give you a thousand opportunities, did he? You know, I turned, I can remember in my own life that God dealt with me when I was around 14 years old, and there's no doubt the Holy Spirit had my number. I could, the Holy Spirit was drawing me, and I didn't accept Jesus Christ then. And I should have, and I wished I would have. I really, really do, but I didn't. And thank God he gave me another opportunity. I was around 20 years old when I got saved, when he dealt with me the next time. And I really believe that was my last chance. I really believe if I hadn't accepted Jesus Christ then, I probably would have never had another chance. I was headed to hell, and I, oh, I knew it. I very well knew it. And I realized that. And I decided, no, I don't want to go to hell, and I want to be saved. And I went to a local church and, and, and gave my life to the Lord. And thank God for that. But you know, there's a lot of people that have had the opportunity, they've had the opportunity, and they've said, no, I'm not interested, and they turn their back on God, and God gives them up to this reprobate mind. He isn't going to deal with them. That's why a lot of people, it doesn't matter what they do, they think they're okay. They think they're all right. Don't matter what they do, I'm okay, because they don't know any, any different, any better. In that verse 8, this Janese and Jambres in verse 8, uh, says, withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. These Janes and Jambres were Egyptian magicians who was used by Satan as deceivers. Satan will use anybody around you as a deceiver to persuade you. You know, it's you, you don't think this, you think, that only Satan's going to be the one that's going to tempt you. But God has, or Satan has, people that he'll use, won't he? Have you ever been influenced by a co-worker? Have you ever been influenced by people around you? You're trying to live right. You're trying to do right. And the next thing you know, you find yourself going with the crowd. And you're doing things that you know in your heart is wrong. Why? Satan wants to throw all kinds of stumbling blocks in front of us that we will turn our back on the blessings of God. He wants to ruin your testimony. He don't want you to be blessed by God. He don't want you to listen right now. He don't want people to be in this church. He wants to tear his church down from the inside out if he can. He'll use anybody. He'll use anybody that he can. Satan is a deceiver. He's a master of it. He's a liar. There's no truth in him. And he'll, he knows he knows the truth, and he'll take just a little piece of it and twist it and turn it around and mislead people into thinking whatever they want to do is okay. And that's the way he does. 
And that's what he wants to do to you, and he wants to do it to me. He wants me to be a stumbling block. He wants you to be a stumbling block, not a stepping stone for someone to find Christ. It's very important that we realize what we're up against. We're in times that Satan is having a field day, isn't he? He doesn't want the gospel. He doesn't want this church open. He doesn't want messages online. We have struggled to get messages online. People will never know how hard it's been to try to keep the messages going out to our own flock and to those outside our, our doors. Satan wants to stop it. He wants to put it out. And he wants to put you out. He wants to put me out. And that's what he wants to do. And he'll use anybody he can. We're being warned here. It's so easy to be misled, to be influenced by the power of the master deceiver, Satan. Satan will discourage the believer from inside the church. Satan wants to destroy the testimony of this church. You know, it would tickle him to death. If things will, something will happen within our own congregation, within our own walls, and we can have some little flare-up, some little bust-up, some little problem, and I can get mad at him, and he can get mad at her, and this ain't working out, well, I just won't come no more. Well, I'll just quit coming. Little old silly things, any little old simple thing that he can to cause animosity, to have problems within your church, is exactly what Satan wants to do. There's been churches have splits and problems over the color of pew covers and over rather not to change the blinds and the shades and the color of the carpet or what we're going to have at a fellowship dinner. You think that's stupid, but it's truth. People will find any reason in the world to whine and complain and to cause problems. You know who, who institutes that? Satan. That's what Satan wants. He wants to destroy the things of God. And he wants to destroy me and you. He wants, to uh, he wants to destroy our testimony. We can learn from Paul's example and Paul's teaching. Look at verses 10 through 13. Verse 10 says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Verse 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall what? Suffer persecution. Suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Listen, can you, do you know of anybody else in the word of God that went through any more than Paul did? The persecution, the beatings, the imprisonments, all the things that he went through, but he never buckled in, did he? He never buckled in. He, he tells us, he forewarns us that there's going to be persecutions, there's going to be sufferings. We don't know what suffering and persecution is in this country like it's been in other countries, do we? There's been a lot of martyrs for the cause of Christ in other countries for their faith. I don't know how bad it'll get. I don't know. I hope it don't. I hope he comes back before it ever gets to that point, but it could. It could. It very well could. If you stand on the things of God, you don't know somebody ain't going to shoot you right in the face for it. You don't know what they're going to do. You don't know what people's, what's going to come our way. But we do know one thing that he's telling us that it's going to wax worse and worse as time goes on. It's going to get harder. It's going to get worse. But also we can see here, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and, and being deceived. But we also see in verses 14 and 17 the power and the strength to fight off apostasy and Satan's attacks in and through the word of God. What do we need? This is the word. This is the truth. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable 
for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The power and the strength to fight off and to know what's right and wrong, what's true and what's not, is by knowing the truth, ain't it? We need to know the truth. Where is the truth in the Word of God? we got to lean on what we've been taught in the Holy Scriptures, which was inspired by God. And that's where the power and the strength is to fight off Satan's attacks. What did Jesus use when he was being tempted? The Word of God. The Word of God. He didn't say what I think. He didn't say, well, this is what it should be. He quoted Scripture, didn't he? And that's what works. Satan can't deal with this. This is no, he has no strength over this. We have no strength within ourselves to fight off Satan, but the word of God does, amen? He tells us here in those scriptures that the Bible is for salvation. Without the word of God, how could you be saved? It's for Christian living. What? It's for Christian living? Huh. Well, if it's for Christian living, then if we're going to live a Christian life, then we're going to have to read the book, ain't we? Huh? We're going to have to read the book. We're going to have to study the book. That's why you come to Sunday school. That's why you come on midweek service. That's why you come on Sunday night. That's why you come on Sunday morning. That's why you have a devotion time at home and you read a little bit of the Word of God every day. How many times do you eat physical food? Most of us too many times and way too much, amen? When you look down, you can't see your shoes no more. You know that something's not right, huh? You know we're obese when it comes to gluttoning and eating food, but are you obese on the Word of God? Are you gluttoning on the Word of God? Just how much of it do you take in? How much do you read? How important is it? How sweet is it? How hungry are you for it? It tells us it's profitable for teaching. That's doctrine. To teach us doctrine, to teach us truth, conviction, for reproof. When you read the Word of God and you read it and you think, or you hear somebody preach it or teach it, you think, he's talking to me. No, the speaker's not talking to you. The Holy Spirit's talking to you. Whatever he's brought to your attention means you don't align up with what he was saying. There's something not right. You need, to, you need to straighten up. You need to make changes or maybe just do better. Conviction is reproof. You feel conviction. You feel bad toward what you're doing. Before you get saved, you have a conscience, don't you? If you do something you shouldn't do, you say something you shouldn't have said, you said a potty word, you said something mean or hateful with hatred in it, you think, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. I shoot, I shouldn't have done that. But it don't take long to overcome your conscience. But the Holy Spirit is what convicts you. As a child of God, if I do something wrong, that conviction will bother me and bother me and bother me a whole lot longer than my conscience until I make it right. There's a difference. It says it's for correction. The Word of God is for correction, setting it right, getting right. That's what it's for, to get right with God, get in line with him. That's why we need to read. Discipline is for instruction. To live right. What to do, what not to do. God don't want to keep any blessings or fun from you. God wants the best for you. He don't want to withhold things. You know, that's one of them devil's lies that I believed for a long time. I thought, well, I don't want to go to church and I don't want to be a Christian because I want to have fun and I'm young and I've got all kinds of stuff I want to do and that's just boring and that's for old people. No, that was such a devil's lie. Such a devil's lie. I didn't know what fun and enjoyment was until I got saved, amen? The thing, I could do anything now I want to, but most of the things I used to want to do, I don't want to do them no more. The things that I thought was fun and cool, they wasn't fun and cool. I just thought they was. God gave me something a whole lot better. And praise God for that. If you're a listener and you think, well, I don't want to go to church. That's just a bunch of hypocrites. Well, come on in. You can be a hypocrite too because we're all hypocrites. We're sinners saved by grace and we're trying 
to get in line with the things of God. Don't let Satan talk you out of salvation. Don't let Satan take, talk you out of a good life because that's what he wants to do. Also, the word of God also helps us to mature. Mature as a believer. If you're listening or you're here in the auditorium, ask yourself, are you more mature Christian believer now than you was last week, last month, last year, or maybe five years ago? Are you walking closer with the Lord? Do you know more of his will? Do you have a better understanding of him and what it's all about? Or are you at the same level of play? Probably you're not reading. You're probably not studying if you're not maturing. Also, the word equips the believer for service. You know, it's hard to believe. I've, I've shared this. When I first got saved, I absolutely was scared to death to come to church. I was scared to death that they would ask me to read a scripture or to pray. We used to take turns reading scriptures in Sunday school. My stomach would be upset. I'd have to go to the bathroom a hundred times before I went to church. Nerves tore up because I was scared to death. Shy and timid and backward toward public or speaking. Who in the world would ever thought that I'd be speaking today? For years, I worked with young people. Who would ever thought God would use a dumb little boy like me? You can tell I still ain't got nothing to work with. But I'll tell you this, God loves me. And he loves you. And he wants to use you even greater than that. Young people, listen to me. The world's got plenty to offer but God's got a whole lot more. Let him have his way in your life. To claim the victory and mature and to be able to uphold and withstand the problems, the apostasy, the false teaching and the persecution and the things that's going on around us, we need to be in tune with the word of God. We need to be in tune with God through the word of God. Amen. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 40, 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, we don't have anything to worry about. God's got our back, amen. What in the world can Satan throw at us that God can't take care of it? What problem can come in your life that God won't walk with you and take care of you? Has God ever failed you? Has he ever let you down? Has he ever left you alone? Absolutely not. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes within. There's nowhere you can go. There's nowhere you can run. There's nowhere you can hide from the love of God. Amen. I'll tell you a little story. I don't want to squirrel here, but I'm going to tell you a little story. When I first got saved, me and my beloved hadn't been married too awful long. We had a little spat. You know, that happens sometimes. And I got mad. I don't know what I was mad about. I don't remember what was over. It doesn't really matter. But I was still out horsed around in my, my old car, hot rod car, and working with the guys. And I left going to work overtime on a Saturday. And I said, I'll tell you what I'm thinking myself. I said, I'll tell you what, as soon as I get out of work, I'm, I worked over in Blacksburg. I said, I'm going down around Tech, and I'm going to horn run around. I just ain't full of none of it. I'm sick of the church. I'm sick of marriage. I'm sick of all of it. I'm done with it. I went, got off, and oh, I'm a big boy. I blow my chest out like a bandy rooster, and out through there I went, and I thought I was going to be something. And I got about three red lights out, and the Holy Spirit said, Son, go on home. Go on home. You can't run. You can't run. You see, there was a difference in me. I was still fighting the flesh, but the Holy Spirit was within. And it says, no, you ain't going to do that. You're going to go on home like a good little boy and do right. You're going to do right. You're going to go to church. And you'll make things right when you get there. And I did. You see, look how much greater God is. Look how much greater God is. Why will you not accept him? Why will you not follow him? 
Why does people, men, uh, women mentioned this this morning, why does people not want to be in Sunday school? Why do you not want to hear the word of God proclaimed as often as you can? I've had people say, well, it's not for me. Well, maybe that's why your life's not what it ought to be. Maybe it's not what it could be. Maybe your life could be a whole lot better. Did you ever happen to think about that? If you come to services one time a week and be blessed by God and never do anything else, if that's your conviction and God's all right with it, well, I'm surely all right with it. But you know, God says not to neglect assembling yourselves together, doesn't he? We're assembled. I reckon I'm supposed to be here, amen? Can you get too much of God? Can you get too much sweetness of God? I bet you ain't ever been founded on the goodness of God. You know, God wants a whole lot more. He wants to love you. He wants to lift you up. He wants to take you to places you didn't know you could go. He wants to bless you. You know, I told Diane, I said, you know, there's a part of me, I think we should dread judgment because there's a lot of things we're not too proud of in our life that we could have done better. But you know, there's one little part of me like to say, I just kind of like to see just exactly if I did do anything right. It'd be nice to, for the Lord to say, come on in, I'm proud of you. Look here what, what you did do. Because a lot of times we don't, we don't see the evidences, do we? Don't you want to do something good for your Lord? Have you ever asked, in closing, have you ever asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life to save you? Can you claim Jesus as your own Savior? Have you ever admitted to God that you're lost and you need to be saved? You've never asked him to save you. In Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All means everyone. It means you, you, and you, and every listener, me. But he also tells us in Romans 10, 9, if that will confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God that raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You know, there's a lot of people that has a head knowledge about Jesus, but they've never trusted him with all their heart. Have you? Are you trusting Jesus with all your heart that he died for your sins and that he will save you if you just ask him and that he's prepared a perfect heaven for you? Have you ever really done that? Because it says in Romans 10, 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. It's not with your head, it's not with your brain, your mind, but it's with your heart. Do you believe with all your heart and righteousness and with the mouth? Will you confess with your mouth? Will you admit it? Will you say, Lord, I realize and I know Jesus died for me and I believe that with all my heart and I'll confess it with my mouth to you and to man. I want you to save me. And Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever, whosoever, Yes, that's you with the bad habits. Yes, that's you with the problems. Yes, that's you with the broken life. Yes, that's you that's got a lot of dirty laundry. And yes, it's for you that you think you're so good, but you're not. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ain't it wonderful to know that you can't do anything too bad that God won't save you? Will you ask him? Acts 4, 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You know, I'm thankful that Jesus Christ says it's finished. We don't have to worry about our salvation. He took care of it. He paid our sin debt in full. I don't have to worry about it. I trust him. He paid it. It's done. It's over. I received eternal life. I'm good. I'm not worthy, but I'm saved by the bloodshed of Jesus Christ. Have you ever done this? If you can't remember a time, you may not remember the date, but can you reflect upon a time that your life was changed forevermore? 
I'm not good at remembering dates, but I can remember the time when Jesus saved my soul. Have, if you've not done that, and God is dealing with you now, you need to humble yourself and just simply say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I admit it. I understand and realize your son Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to pay my sin debt. And you said if I believe that with all my heart and I confess it with my mouth and ask you to save me, you will and I want you to save me. Will you do that right now? If you do that, let some of us know. Let somebody know you've done it. Get somewhere in a good Bible teaching, preaching church and let them know. Be baptized to be uh, identified as a believer and put yourself in service for the Lord. Live your life for his glory. May God bless you. Until next time, goodbye.